First hand accounts from participants and eyewitnesses of the happenings and events that occurred during the struggle for Irish freedom in South Tipperary, starting with the formation of the volunteers in 1913 and ending with the truce of July 11, 1921. The documentary will be in four parts. Number one part will commence with uh, the events surrounding 1916 in County Tipperary and also with the Solahead Beg ambush which happened on the day the first all air met followed by the story of Knock Long uh, the rescue of Sean Hogan at Knock Long which occurred on May 13th 1919 they were events that startled the Irish nation at the time we are very fortunate that for our interviews we have first of all Paul Merrigan, a pre-1916 volunteer who was on hand after the shooting of two policemen by Michael O'Callaghan uh, um, at a place called um, Kilross outside the Prairie Town. We also have Matt Hogan, brother of the late Sean Hogan, who participated in the Solahead Big ambush and was the central figure in the rescue at Knock Long. Matt, a 14-year-old boy in, in January 1919, brought tea for the week to the ambushers who were awaiting the police escort with the Jellic Knight for Solahead Big. He knew personally all who participated in the ambush. So, some weeks after the ambush, Matt was arrested, brought to the Prairie Police Barracks, and later transferred to Dublin Castle, where he was detained for several weeks. We also have an interview with the late Jim Power, who was then chairman of the Third Tipperary Brigade Commemoration Committee, and whose input, encouragement, enthusiasm, and continuous urging contributed in a major way to much of the work that was done and is now being provided and produced in this documentary. I also would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to several other people who contributed in a major way to having this documentary recorded, particularly Michael Barlow and Willie Tootie, two active members as joint treasurers of the Commemoration Committee. I would also like to pay tribute to the late Willie Ryan of Kilfetal, who was a most active and enthusiastic supporter of the project. Also to um, another departed chairman, the late Jim Crean of Feathered, who early on was a supporter of the idea. Of course, it would be remiss of me if I overlooked to pay tribute to the person who coordinated this effort. Uh, who directed it from the background, and that was Carrie Atchison, who is still Secretary of the Torture Prairie Brigade Commemoration Committee. There are several others indeed whose input 
in one way or another was essential in producing this production. During the course of the recordings and during particularly the editing, I have had my critics and of course who hasn't and I'm always prepared to listen to criticism but I would say to those who one way or another were unhappy with the progress made please don't pass judgment until you've undertaken something like this before. I am delighted to say that I undertook this uh, as an amateur in a voluntary capacity. Along the way I have to pay compliment as well to the cameraman Pat O'Donnell whose work is there for all to see. I also uh, must say that we had very um, unforeseen difficulties in the editing process. I also must take this opportunity of saying thanks to another member of the Torture Prairie Brigade Commemoration Committee who took us out of our difficulty, that is Ramey Shanahan in Hollyford, whose equipment and whose expertise has helped us in editing this product. Along the way, we met several wonderful people, many old veterans of the War of Independence, many beautiful, lovely ladies of coming among, whose charm and whose good nature and whose generosity as we visited their homes uh, was there for us to see and to appreciate. Also the many people, relatives of a later generation of the people who participated, who gave us a hearty cake being a forte everywhere we went. Indeed, there are many things uh, I should say, but one I must, and that is that this is a story that we're producing as we found it. We are adding no flavor to it. It is the story told by participants and eyewitnesses as they saw it, as they now recall it many years later. We are hopeful that the work will be of some benefit to students of history of a future generation. However, our objective was to record in the best way possible the story as it was told to us by the people who participated in it by people who lived through it and by people who suffered the consequences and were prepared to pay the price and make the sac sacrifices that their involvement in the struggle for freedom involved. We now come to the first person who will be interviewed on the program and who you will see. That is Matt Hogan. Matt, as I said earlier, was the second youngest detainee of the War of Independence. He was involved as a little boy from the beginning of that war. His brother became one of the folk heroes of it. He was the friend of Sean Tracy, of Dan Breen, of Seamus Robinson, and of the other people who participated in Salahed Bay. Their names and their deeds as this documentary will unfold, uh, are deeds and are part of history that any nation, any county, any region would be proud of. We we'll let you judge the story from here on. Indeed, we have you uh, today as the brother of Sean Hogan, indeed, as a person yourself, you have many memories of the War of Independence, possibly you were one of the youngest internees of that time, I believe as a 13-year-old boy, mm -hmm. after Salah Hidbeg, you were a prisoner of the RIC. Yes, Could you yes. tell us about that briefly? Well, uh, I was taken to the prairie, Alex first. I would have two nights there at the time. Then I was let out, and about a week after, I was taken again, and I gave a week there, 
shown here at Knock Long. Well, it was the only thing bef that like before that, but I didn't know now what was coming out. I was to go up to what they call the Tin House, uh, Dan Green's book like that. That time there, I was to be up and down there, so Sean Tracy was there, Dan Breen, Sean, and Seamus Robinson. He was down around it. When you refer to the Tin House, what, where actually was it okay? Uh, it was only about uh, half a mile away from me, across the, the fields. That's across our own road. That's a prairie down the road. And uh, their land were gone, so they coming on to the road. But there was a bite of Hogan in from out. They were from out of a land like the Hogan. And he was in the Jack Hogan. He was to stop and rest. But he went away then and left, left the, the house to the lads. And they were in it maybe for uh, six or seven weeks. They could be maybe more. At the time, they used to have the beds there. They used to sleep there. Well, were you involved yourself in some episodes in the War of Independence? Oh, I was. I was with uh, the Northern Company and everything there. But I wasn't in an ambush like this. I was um, a scout on some of them, like, you know? Yes. And then I, was, I went to a couple of them there, like on the Donaski or on the road. We were going to, to snipe them coming from Dundrum onto Dunaski, the, but they didn't turn up that time. What are your memories of Sean Tracy? You were a neighbour of his, but still you were a very young guy. He was much older than you. Well, uh, well, it's just to know him now. It's much, much... You didn't ever um, speak with him, or...? Well, I did, just at the dinner I was there. That's all. Uh, when they were there in the... You visited him and yeah, there were... I was up and down there several times at that place. And this was a place that you stayed? That's the place they used to stay before. They were even waiting, we'd stay for... Uh, they might be different, there was... They were there all the time. But they used to have different uh, lads with them, then come and... They'd come today, like, and... Thinking that the uh, ammunition had come out. The jelly knife was there. From out from the prairie. The Solid Big. You're talking now prior to the Solid Head Big ambush. This is the Solid Head Big yes. This is the Solid Head. Before that, like, that they were... In the Tin House. The, yes. And they were going that... I think they went for about four weeks before... anything happened, before they came out with each other. Well, now, after not long, of course, Sean Hogan became a household word. Not alone in Tipperary, but all over Ireland. In the... Uh, Months immediately after not long, and up to the truth, did you meet your brother Sean during that time? No, I didn't meet him for, for well, I suppose it to be about nine months I met him. Just one night, just to go to him. Um, oh, it over near Golden now. I had to go to see him. They were only for a few minutes. And he was up in Dublin all the time after, nearly all the time. He just came down for that. I see. Yeah. Well, um, after not long and right up to the truth, um, you yourself, of course, were on the run, but your family, were the other members of your family involved? There was no one, there was only the mother there, the, and, and, and uncle of mine. There was only the two of us there together. Yes. Oh, there was only two of you in family? Uh, yes. Oh, I see. Uh, now, Dan Breen, of course, you must have known Dan Breen. Oh, well. I, know, I knew it then, well, yes. Have you any memories of Dan uh, during that time, or meeting with him, or speaking? Well, no, with him? but Dan worked in, in the, the um, he was on the railway. He worked a lot on the railway. He did. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Prior to, yeah. to the War of Independence. Yeah. If I was yeah. to ask you, Matt, what is your outsta most outstanding memory in your lifetime uh, of that part of Irish history? What would you recall, me? Well, I suppose the, the doctor. The rescue. Yeah, with the rescue. Really. Because they were determined, no matter who was, which was arrested, they were going to try to rescue them anyway. Die in the attempt, as I say. It must, you know, 
very few people become a legend in their own lifetime, and your yeah. brother became a legend at a very young age. And as a, as, as a person, you know, whom you knew, of yeah. course, and being your only yeah. brother, yeah. Uh, how did he himself react to that, looking back in after years? Well, uh, I don't think he minded much. We never spoke much about it. Or would he speak much about he it? He wouldn't. He didn't have any He's had a thing about it. Of course, um, uh, his yeah. arrest was uh, as a result of his seeing a lady home from a dance. Yes, right. Have you, did you know that lady or did you ever know No, I didn't know yes. her. I, I think she, I could have met her on. Yes. Oh, right, but I could. She is still alive. She's still alive. And we will be interviewing yeah. her on this film. Yes. 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 The dance was at him and all the wires. That's right. Yes. Better known as Lady Kate. Lady, I knew that him well. Because he had a cousin just across the road from Edigan. There were crows, and he used to come there regularly. So as a great friend of Lady's work, yes. Had you, well, of course, you were young at yeah, that stage, young, you would not be going. I knew him, but no, no. He was an Irish speaker. So was that. that is right. Yes. Um, now, Sean Tracy, speaking of Irish language, etc., yeah. Sean Tracy was. Uh, a very dedicated member of oh, the Gaelic League. Oh, he was, that's right. Um, Tipperary, uh, during his time, he was responsible for organising Irish classes as such. Yes. Are there any branch of the Gaelic League or Irish classes present in Tipperary Town, to your knowledge? No. Yes. Because I didn't know that, that they were not I'm sure now. I said they were speed up. As a young man, did you go to Irish classes? No, I didn't go to Irish uh, the only, well, um, there was one man that was very fond of it, uh, Jimmy Kelly, Davis Street. He's like, the Tripoli business. Yes. He was belonging to the RA. Very much. Well, Matthew, you have a, had so far a very, very colourful life, and I'm sure there's a lot more of colour left in the many years that you have to live. Uh, yeah. We are delighted to have this opportunity because you are a part of Irish history and you can feel justly proud of being possibly the youngest, or at least the second youngest internee of the War of Independence. Well, I suppose I was, eh? Do you still have very clear memories uh, of, of, you know, the upset to your family at that stage? You were, uh, Sean, your uh, brother, oldest brother, was one of the most wanted men in Ireland, and you, as a 14-year-old boy, was um, interned. Yeah. Uh, it must have been an upsetting time well, for your family well, at home. Well, it was. And it was, I tell you, just <coughs> there was no one left in there, so to, to look after the, the place which we had at Walford. It was 22 or 23 years. And I had to do the milking and go to the cream and Everything so that I didn't get a terrible lot of school to me. That's the only Well, indeed, whatever about your schooling, you're a very able man and a very easy person to interview, and you have a depth of knowledge, and your memory is extremely good. Well, that's as good as that. Are you, yeah. as a person, looking back uh, on the sacrifices that your brother and yourself and your family made, and indeed your neighbours, men like Sean Tracy and Dan Bream? A small little area that produced so many people, Denny Lacey from oh, the very same area. Looking well, back. I know Denny well. Tom Cherry, good old guy. I knew a lot of the, the old crowd. For Jerry Kiley, Rufi. Yeah, he was killed in the, what, in the Civil War, he was killed. They were up in the East you know. Do you believe at this stage, you know, the great sacrifices that your family and your neighbours made, do you believe? that today that people appreciate that fully or do you believe we have used the freedom that you all you people got for us as we should have? Well I said that they do, they appreciate the Irish. And it was very good as yes, Well Matt, again I say it is wonderful talking with you. We'll be back someday in the future in to get more details of Salah Beg from you. I want to thank you very yeah. much on behalf of the Toronto Pair of the Day Well, Paul Merrigan, you are 86 years of age. Yes. Uh, you are one of the few survivors 
of the people who joined the National Volunteers in 1914, and then you took um, Owen McNeil's side in the split at that stage and joined the Irish Volunteers. Uh, <clears throat> what I want to ask you about, Paul, is 1916, uh, your memories of 1916. Very fresh memories. Could you recall for us what actually happened in and around Tipperary? Well, there was much activity other than John Tracy. You know. uh, what kind of activity was he carrying out? He was organising and he meant to he do justice. And he was organising the volunteers. So he was on his way to Dublin and he meant to get the to organize, as I say, trying to get to Dublin. But some of the, the countries at the time. You know. Well, Paul, you yourself were involved in one of the episodes of 1916 insofar as the Tipperary area was concerned. I understand as a very young man, uh, you were present at Hennessy's immediately after Michael uh, O'Callaghan shot the two policemen. Correct. Could you relate for us your memories of that? Of course, well, when I arrived, he had a workman the name of Hennessy. Finnessy. Maybe you can tell us. Now, Paul, I was asking you about uh, the O'Callaghan episode in 1916 at Hennessy's, outside the Brary Town. Yes, and, and just that one, isn't it? Yes. And you were the doctor, Ginny Lacey's flying column. You were a member of Ginny Lacey's flying column. Right? Yeah, well, sure. Now, in 1916, after that event at Hennessy's, what actually took place? Was there a police activity in the area? Were you under suspicion yourself? I was, well, sure. At five o'clock in the morning, the police arrived from the ferry, surrounded all the house and the road county looking for it. Me Callan at the time. You know, and from there, Me Callan was on the run. He went to different cousins' houses. I remained that, you know. So it came on to a time when he was staying at a man's house. I don't want to miss the hands. This guy he had was under battle of duty. He was an ex-soldier. And I knew that he got a resident. I alerted the people. Cannon removed from there to another house who were famous. In the old days, and I haven't mentioned their name, Michael Kiley, he was one of the company officers in the Mount Bruce Company at the time. Karen wasn't too long in bed, and his, his house was surrounded. Karen got out to Gable Inn, that went to the open house, and he got out. Mick Kiley was on guard. And his excuse to the police was at the time, what did he do? No. I was attending to a cow who was sick. Kevin got out and moved on to the Indian place called Ballyhoe. He had a lot of cousins around there. And from there, he got in touch with other friends. With this and eventually he got to America disguised as a priest. And while he was in America, he wrote a letter, mentioned my name, that he hoped to see me. But he arrived in the prairie sometime after the throats, they gave him that big reception. Coming back into the prairie to his old native town again, the church light procession for him at the time. Um, he was still a, a volunteer, he was very active, and remained so, is the same, during that period. Um, Paul, earlier I was asking you, uh, as one of the few survivors of General Denny Lacey's flying column today, uh, could you give us a brief outline of what life was like in a flying column? 
It was a great light, and it was a hard light. You went into a bed, and the people were really... The mothers of those houses, they adored you like a child, you know. It brought them back to the days that they read about history. They were females, what they went through. And various other generations back it on, it's the same. But you appear to have great admiration for the Fenians because yes. Dan Breen insisted on calling himself a Fenian rather than an IRA man all this. That's right. It, it meant a name for the old IRA, actually. To use the name is the same as Fenians. In, in the flying column with Denny Lacey, what kind of a man was Denny Lacey? Oh, well, a very strict discipline officer. Yes, he wanted no man, no man at the column ever took a drink. You were disbanded out of the column. If you took a drink or smelled a drink around him, you know. And eventually, things were very getting hot for us. We were on the run, but it turned out that the British Empire men were on the run from us. They couldn't come out unless a big convoy, maybe 16 or 18 lorries at the time. You know, but Things were getting hot anyway when he appointed four section commanders in the wind that we'd be surrounded. I uh, had charge of so many men. I was to look after those in the case of a round up. Um, you'd have to have their welfare, you know. Looked after at the same. And if anyone was wounded, you didn't leave him. You took him with you, no matter what the consequence was. But while we strayed a bit from not long, I was anxious that we would get a picture of what life was like as a member of a flying column in Tipperary. We we'll go back again a little bit in time. Uh, there are two events, you know, that are very striking and connected. And we're here in Not Long um, this afternoon, the 15th of October, actually, the day after the anniversary of Sean Tracy's death in Dublin. Can you recall for me what uh, imprint or impression uh, the news of Sean Tracy's death left on the volunteers uh, when uh, uh, the news was conveyed from Dublin? Well, Sean Tracy's name that time, time it helped us to form the volunteers, as the same. They all looked up to Sean Tracy as the one of the greatest men Ireland ever had. You know? We took to uh, up to him as such a man, you know, and his name made it very easy for us to organize the volunteers at the time. Can you remember his funeral in Tulfigal? I, I can, sure. His remains came to the mixture on the night before, and his remains was kept to the church of Salias which was his parish. On the day of his funeral, the military came out to stop the military funeral. And the priest at that time, he says, you won't, you won't have any military funeral. Because the PP himself, he was administrator at the time, he says, you we'll mind your own business, or words to that effect. So the officer in charge, who was the British military at the time. But on the road along is the same. From the time the funeral left to King Eagle, yes. the funeral was so large, the first of them was nearly arrived in King Eagle, which was two and a half miles from the prairie to his burial spot, it's the same. As an ordinary, sorry, Paul, continue. Yes. When the funeral was over, we had a comrade, and we get Sean his rights as a soldier when one of our comrades fired shots over his career in, in, at the King's Eagle Cemetery. As a volunteer on the ground, what did names in those days like Cahill Brew, Michael Collins, 
Eamon de Valera, W.T. Cosgrave, what did they mean to the, the member of the flying car? Men do not the same. We couldn't take any orders only from headquarters at the time. Um, the first action was Bonner RIC barracks here in Dates of the country. And the purpose was if they, say, if they were in the barracks to take their guns, you know, and use those guns. We weren't too plenty for our guns at the time. You know, I met up this shoot a soldier or policeman to get a gun, as they say. We were getting maybe through France and England or other places guns. You know. And organization was kind of watertight. You wouldn't have called now. I mean they were going by names only number. In case that if some of those for us were caught that they looked to the homes and they got to the homes, as they say. It was mean, you know. What for you, Paul, was the most saddest moment in the War of Independence? Well, there was a lot of sad happiness. Poor Danny, Danny Sadler, he was shot accidentally in a place called Clunian Village, outside the village, where they come to just, just accidentally. He was in the British Army, and his country was also in the British Army, and they hadn't met for a number of times, but I happened to be there. You get a time for a dinner hour, and time was time, but they say you had to report. No matter what the country, even if you to leave your dinner after, you had to be there five minutes before time. It was I already had discipline and praise and everything else is the same. Yeah, um, so you'd... You recall the accidental death of Denny Sadler as one of the saddest? Was a joyful occasion for you during that period? Well, our first experience was Thomastown, ambush. And there was a convoy coming through, and the column relayed them. This side of the village of Thomastown. One of our comrades, Michael Fitzpatrick, got wounded in the action. We took Michael anyway and we took him to a friend's house. And the bullet was remained in his leg. And he suffered a lot, the lead bullets being very poisonous. And eventually he was taken to St. John's. Hospital in Limerick. It was known as a blue nuns, the sisters, looked after those, as the same. Sure, in my own time, when I was wounded, these blue nuns were so much worse than cause. In a rare mistake place, I was carried into the nuns' private ward during that time. Where were you wounded, Paul? In the left leg. I had only three. There was only two yes. flesh wounds. Yes. But where did it, where did the event? What what uh, um, action was it in? Well, it was actually one of our comrades who were waiting for a meal, and the people that I was getting this meal, and one of these comrades, he weren't, I suppose, maybe. Careful enough with the gun, but the gun slipped out of his hand and the trigger took and it was on load and rebound and I got struck in the left leg. Oh, oh. Paul, to, go, uh, to come back to uh, uh, not long, in uh, um, May 1919, the rescue of Sean Hogan took place here on the 13th of May, a Tuesday evening. Uh, I asked you earlier on the platform what was your memory of it. Uh, could you recall for us the events, some of the events that occurred immediately afterwards? Well, immediately after it, all the volunteers, they organized it in such a way that they were prepared to sacrifice their life. 
as the same as Shaw Tracy. Our country did, is the same. Volunteers are injured in, is the same. But there's a period in, at this time, we had a lot of guns at my mission in a place called Barrows and Shrook. All our guns and ammunition. Some of the Germans are actually taken for society was in the area the same. But from there, Calvary was to take the barracks Old King Malik and Ballanders. They look for me from the Calvary area to block the roads, which we did. Some of the men from the Prairie Age area took part, actually, in Kilmelik and the attack. And our job was block the roads. So we just, I can recall, Mary Wire was no one uh, that refers to the area. Trees, 20 or 30 feet high, all these trees. We were to block the roads, which we did in the same way as a fence, maybe 20, 30 trees, where they couldn't get through. Um. Paul, in conclusion, who, looking back over those many years, would you uh, say were the outstanding characters in the War of Independence and in, and in the years that have passed since? Well, uh, you could say every man was a very sincere man. We took, we took the order of allegiance as a volunteer to a man the man, Con Maloney. Con Maloney became chief of staff of observation of the Republican Army. memory over quite a period of time and indeed as this job of documenting the events of that time pass on we'll be coming back to you again for different episodes so at this stage I would like to thank you with these
Tom Fitzpatrick, you are the chairman of the Knock Long Development Association. Indeed, your interest in what happens around Knock Long is a, a very um, deep one, and you have proved that it's also a one where you're a man who moves to get things done. As chairman of the Development Association, I understand you are the driving force behind having the plaque to commemorate uh, the rescue of Sean Hogan here at Knock Long erected. And indeed, uh, also, I note from that plaque that you had the great Sean Ford, uh, better known in later years as Tomás Malone from Nina, unveiling it. What uh, was responsible for motivating you? I know you are the son of Bill Fitzpatrick, who was quite involved in uh, the events that led up to the rescue of Sean Hogan here, uh, from that Bill Fitzpatrick from La Kelly. I would like to ask you, why have you developed such an interest in uh, the history of Knock Long and particularly uh, events relating to the War of Independence? Well, of course, I, I, I gather I, I, I seem to have a deep interest all the time. It doesn't seem to go away from me. It's, it's, it's just part of my makeup. And, and uh, anything uh, connected with that period, I seem to have a, a great interest in, in getting involved and doing whatever I could. But, um, we have, we have a development association here which long going back 10 or 12 years and we have uh, achieved uh, quite a lot of different types of uh, media factor here in the and we've got uh, Renton Irish Cottage, we've got cottages built here, we've got uh, a new sports field, uh, uh, we've got uh, a new community centre built. And during that period we decided at a particular stage to um, uh, direct the plaque to commemorate this historic event here in the club. Now when you ask me where I got all the answers from, I suppose I got the answers from listening to my father when I was growing up by telling the stories of all these particular historic events at different times and the neighbours would be in and they would talk and they would recall the Le Kelly ambush and they would recall the rescue of the club, which was all time to go look at it. And I've had these stories told over and over again and I suppose it's just deep seated in, 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 in me as I say it. Answer your question about the interest, I say that's how I got my interest. Jimmy Power. Jimmy is a member of the committee of the Third Degree Commemoration uh, Committee. Uh, Jimmy, you have been very involved in this type of thing for many years, a very active member of that committee, and a man who has been highlighting the need for this type of coverage of the events of 60 or 70 years ago. Not long and Salah Hidbeg. You are located close enough to both of them. What impressions have you left on you as a person of a generation later than those times? Well, like coming from a family that was greatly involved in the War of Independence, both at uh, my father's side and my mother's side, I definitely wouldn't be their son if I didn't have an interest. And my big interest in this is to try and record before it is too late, before scenes like that station outside will be done away with. My big interest is to record as much as possible for posterity, for future generations. And uh, while we have an awful lot of people have gone to their eternal reward, I'm glad to say that even at this late stage, we are doing something in the committee to pass on to future generations history. And, uh, listening to Paul Merrigan there today and I'm so glad that Paul is with us yet and there must be a few more in the area around who will be able to uh, give us some little thought on what happened and that my primary interest is to try and bring out as much of this as possible. Now why and that's where my father God rest him, was um, captain of Mount Rose Company and since I was a child I've been steeped in this history and probably lived through all the ambushes. He was involved in Knock Long. Uh, I wouldn't say Knock Long it was John Hogan but he was involved in Kilmallock and he was also involved in Belly Landers. Now the things he've told me uh, as only when I got on in years that I realized how valuable they were. And I was so sorry that I didn't listen to a lot more of the things he told me. 
grown up, I thought maybe a lot of it was rubbish. And this is what's happening with history today. The young people doesn't realise how much was involved and the sacrifice that was made by the people that went before them. Now, uh, he often told me that um, they would be away from home for three months. They just couldn't come back home. And they never got a change of underclothing or anything. And um, they never at any stage thought that they were going to get pensions or anything for it. They did it for the simple reason that they wanted to get rid of the British Empire and they had controlled us too long. Jimmy, looking back and on, as you have indeed and carefully examined uh, in detail the history of that period, what, in your opinion, was the most outstanding event in Tipperary during the War of Independence? Well, the filming of Nablon today must have been the most outstanding event in, in history, in Munster anyway. And I think in Ireland, uh, my reading of history is that there was parts of Ireland that didn't know there was trouble on the town. I mean, you wouldn't go to certain parts of the country to Prairie and they never knew that such a thing uh, as a war of independence was on. And that was in a lot of counties. Now, the previous speaker referred to Barrows of Shrook. Barrows of Shrook was the hub of activity. Uh, and I hope we'll be able to visit it and take some shots of the actual farm house yet. It is still there. And um, there is many, many historic ambushes that I have felt. My father was involved as captain in the Balmasak ambush. And uh, an uncle of mine got wounded. Now the story goes that that uncle would have been executed in Cork jail only for a doctor Dowling that was in the prairie at the time who kept his wounds open for 18 months before he left them healed because if they healed he'd be taken away and executed. Things like that are living in my memory and I want them passed on for history. Oh, sons imprisoned spend Those tales we can hear daily and the deeds of valiant men as the war goes on unceasingly through valley, hill and glen. They searched for Sean at midnight, his comrades with him slept. MacReady's murdering bloodhounds in silence on them crept. Our heroes fought as brave men should and made a gallant fight. With bullet food they did conclude the lives of smitten white. In a crowded Dublin street, Sean died on a dim October day. The story will be told with pride while men in Ireland stay. With trusty guns held in his hand to slew towns, he laid low. Twas well. They had no braver foe. When the British saw the battle, they shook with fear and dread. And machine gun did rattle, and our hero bold fell dead. Sean Tracy killed, Sean Tracy killed, was born along. No bells were rung, no queen was sung, he died for Ireland free. Looking here, actually, at the road leading from Tipperary to Salahid Bay, 
This is uh, Salahid Beg, where the famous ambush took place on the 21st of January 1919. As we look down the road, that was the actual route that the policemen, Constable MacDonald and Constable O'Connell, with County Council employees, Godfrey and Flynn, came from Tipperary with the Jelly Knight for Salahid Beg Quarry. Where I'm standing is the actual gateway where the ambush, uh, where Sean Tracy and Pat McCormick stood to take part, uh, and from this gateway, Sean Tracy fired the actual shot that were responsible for starting the War of Independence. In relation to the War of Independence, this, this actual spot was where that war began, when MacDonnell and O'Connell were killed as a result of the volley of shots that rang out. It was, I suppose, one of the most controversial ambushes in the whole War of Independence. And to this very, very day, an air of uncertainty exists as to what took place. There are undisputable facts. And they are very simply that the Irish volunteers assemb assembled here for four or five days previous to the 21st of January, awaiting the arrival of the Jellic Knight from Tipperary. They expected a much bigger police guard than the two constables who accompanied the Jellic Knight. As a result, in the days, over the four or five days, different people assembled here to participate, but because they were a volunteer army and nobody on the run at that stage, they had to return to their farms or their place of employment. But Dan Breen, Sean Tracy, Sean Hogan, Paddy Otherwire, Paddy McCormick, Ty Crow, and Michael Ryan were here on the 21st of January 1919. And here at this side, we are definite that McCormick and Tracy were placed at each side of this gate. Further along the ditch was placed the other members of the volunteer party. When the horse and cart with Godfrey Flynn and the policemen approached, the other hands up who shouted. And here the controversy arises. Shots rang out. Most people say fired by Sean Tracy. And Constable MacDonald fell first. O'Connell made an effort to escape and he was also shot. There was a distance of about 15 yards between the two constables on the roadside. The undisputable facts of the case are that the order hands up was definitely cold. The policemen responded in a negative way. The volunteers took action and two policemen fell dead. The first ambush of the War of Independence had concluded in a space of two minutes and the first fatality since Easter week 19. You were a member of the Salahid Company of the old IRA. I, you were a man who knew Sean Tracy. He accompanied the rest for that, yeah. He accompanied her. Yes. For cheap. When did you join the Jack? Well, 1918. What's it supposed to be? I've got more regular. We had the Tindor Weekly Parade, we said, in, in 1918. Uh, who invited you to join? Or how did you become involved? Ty Crow. More or less out of time with him, and he suggested that we were drilling and they were drilling in the open before that. We say, Oh, that's a mass every Sunday. Sean says he was one of the Sunday, but of course, then they were, the RSC were keeping a very close watch on them, and they had to give up that because they were getting to know too many. Not only did the RSC, they know that all the local volunteers, and of course, in the local volunteers they didn't like to be known by the RSC, that they want to get too prominent. So then we they decided that we had to go out in uh, an open field. We don't in Tomalloy in that place, of course, so where the mines are far away. 
uniform me father wore in that little church below. Well, now, Father Mac, he blessed the pair as one. And after truce and treaty and the parting of the ways, he wore it when he marched out with the rest. And when they bore his body down, that rugged head or praise, they faced the broad like glimmer on his breast. It's just a broad 